Greetings. Uh, this has been a wonderful conference. Very, uh, it's actually very exciting for me, and I'm grateful to be part of it. Not so grateful to be giving a talk, but uh, um, and it's great to see the energy, and hear about new things. Um, this is going to be a strange talk. You don't apologize when you begin, but I just warn you that um, it's first of all very definitely a work in progress. And what I want to do is um, talk about two things that I simply haven't made any progress on. And I think some of you will be able to do. And uh, one of them is quite computational. So um, um, I, I got a message from Dave Benson, I think, today or something about um, passing problems on to the next generation. So maybe that's what part of this paper, this talk is about. What, um, in some sense, this, there's tremendous overlap with our earlier talks, but it's on uh, a topic that uh, the earlier talks don't apply. So what I'm interested in, G, is a linear algebraic group. Over, uh, over a field, one doesn't have to assume algebraically closed. A few technicalities. And by this, um, I mean that it's coordinate algebra, which Chris Negron taught me to write this way, but I'll probably slip and write this way. It's coordinate, in particular, it's an integral domain. It's finitely generated integral domain. And although I'm going to be talking about some fancy things maybe I don't understand too well, what I'm really interested in is modules for G. So is it connected? Oh, yes. In fact, that's part of this. I. At times, I might even assume that it's uh, smooth, but I don't think I need that. So we're interested in modules. Um, but, of course, we pass to categories, and we can't say that much about modules. And... Um, what, what do you mean by, by smooth? Isn't it always... Let, no. But let, let's forget that. Reduced. But, but if it's not reduced, it won't be an integral domain. Right. It's not necessarily reduced, but... Um, so, um, my interest is in somehow identifying interesting classes of infinite dimensional modules over such algebraic groups and sort of, in some sense, giving some sort of classification to compare what we know for finite group schemes. And I'll, I'll spend the first um, maybe half of this talk not about what I want to talk about, but the background which are in two um, compositio papers. Um, I don't know when, the most recent one is in 2023. I don't know the other one is much earlier. About this topic of looking at uh, modules for linear algebraic groups. But let me tell you why, in, on the face of it, this is an unreasonable thing to do. First of all, modules for G means um, co-modules for um, the coordinate algebra of G, although I think of modules as, for G typically as uh, a functorial action of G on uh, commutative K algebras. But let's say they're um, co-modules for O of G. So why is uh, this 
an unreasonable context The fact that it's unreasonable is, I think, uh, a reason to look at it, which is the, uh, I started thinking about support varieties for some things like elementary B and P groups just because people said representations were uh, wild, so it was unreasonable. Anyway, I think this is actually a good, challenging context. So what do we, what do we know about Maji? Um, this is a very nice abelian category. Typically, there are no non-zero projectives. I don't know, for example, um, if, if G is uh, simple, simply connected, I'm not sure what the hypotheses are, but there, there are rarely many, if any. Um, also, injectors are infinite dimensional. So we're certainly not dealing with representation theory of a Frobenius algebra. So there's something, um, something challenging about that. Also, um, we don't have a good cohomology theory. Well, I can't find one. We don't have a useful cohomology. The natural one to take would be rational cohomology. There is such a thing. Hochschild cohomology. But this is often, and if you do the reduced thing, this can often be zero. Is there self extensions in the representation category? Or the right, uh, is it X? X to KK? Um, there are extensions in. Is that what you're what you mean by this? No, I mean I'd like to have some computation, like take the Hochschild cohomology of, uh, you know. But but is it the same as taking x in the, in the abelian category of uh, no. k to k? No. So you you could do that. I don't know. Um, but why would that not be a good cohomology? It it might be okay. I um I, you know it it well I've played around with various things uh, using infinitesimal subgroups. I have not just looked categorically. That's not my instinct. Take it. Okay, that's only uh, one of the. There are all sorts of. Uh, reasons why you would never look at this. Um, See, so I had several. Um, a big obstruction we'll see is there are support varieties. Um, I'm going to describe support varieties. Of support varieties. But what we don't have, so this is the first, the first question. There are two major questions. We don't know what, uh, how to realize something like closed subspaces. We do not have what I think is the nicest theorem in support theory, and it hasn't been mentioned yet, is the theorem of John Carlson. If um, G is a finite group scheme, And if, um, since Julia's already used the notation of pi supports, if pi of, if you have the support variety and you take any 
closed subset. Then there exists, and John tells us how to construct it, a uh, fin finite dimensional module. such that, um, let's call it MY, such that the support of MY is Y. That's, this is terrific for many reasons. First of all, it tells us how to topologize the support variety. Second of all, it tells us there are lots of interesting varieties. I mean, it's really, it underlines a lot. And this is a beautiful construction, very simple just out of cohomology. But we, I don't, one could conjecture somehow, I think what's going on, but I'd, I'd leave this also to those of you who know something about higher mathematics. I think what's going on is whatever I'm constructing, you probably want to take a stack of a quote, but take what I'm doing and taking a quotient by the adjoint action or something. So, but, but still, one doesn't know whether, um, big G stable subsets can be realized. I mean, you don't know that. That's just, we don't know enough about the existence of modules in this general, even for GLN, but we don't know that. Okay, that's one thing. And then this is what I hope I'll spend a little bit of time on and where the computations come. If you can see this, um, I'm gonna also tell you what a stable category is in this context, even though we don't have, um, what was it? They're not uh, project, we don't have a Frobenius category. But what I have to do, I, my stable category, is the Verdier quotient of the bounded derived category of uh, G modules. That's fine. Here comes the problem. Divided by the, um, the complexes, quasi-isomorphic to complexes of mock injectives. Mock, these are complexes, just forget the quasi isomorphic complexes of mock injectives. And so here's the rub, the second problem. What does the mock injection? I'm just about to say. Um, let's say a G module. Maybe I should, it's a one line long, but I should do it over here. Just to give mock injectives a proper stature. Your, your mod G is a big... Yeah, I'm going to really, well, for example, I need to, if I want to talk about injectives or anything like that, I need big. Um, M is a mock injective. By definition, if M restricted to Frobenius kernels is injective for all R. M is a proper mock injective if it's not injective. So once I moved from Evanston to Los Angeles, Andre Suslin visited me a few times, and we spent one week trying to prove that uh, if a module restricted every Frobenius kernel was injective, it was injective. We didn't do it. And then I just stumbled on something that uh, my friends Klein, Partial Scott had done that implied there are lots of them. 
But here's my favorite mock injective. It's due to, um, this is a whole class of examples. Let's just give you one. Uh, this is due to, um, let's get this right, um, Nakano, Sawaji, what I was hesitating in, Hardesky. As soon as I started talking about mock injectives, they went to work and started generating them. And what their example is, you look at the induced module from, let's say, let's take the additive group. Do you know what the additive group is? GA, that has um, coordinate algebra, just uh, K bracket T. And as a functor, it sends a community of K algebra A to its underlying abelian group. So you look at, um, inside there, there's a finite group for every pth power. And you just induce up from the finite group to the group, the field. This is not injective, but it restricts to every um, infinitesimal Frobenius kernel to be injected. Now these mock injectives. Is it GA another example? Pardon? Is G up there GA? Is your mock injective? In this, oh here, yes, yes, yes. I, I can construct them for all two, but I just wanted to make this concrete. Thank you. Oh, you probably said the name. So you're in characteristic P? Characteristic P. That's a Q, so you do That's something. a piece power. I said any piece power. Okay. Find it. See it. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you just tell me what it is. So F it's F here it's GA, the FQ points. FQ. So this sits inside, by the way, it sits inside the regular representation. Maybe I'll work out an example for GA, which is what I can understand. But even for GA, I don't have a, I don't, the answer in these compositio papers involves, or the second one, involves taking the Verdier quotient by mock injectors. I'm ignoring that. And the support varieties only see things, they don't see mock injectors, because it's in some sense, this, this construction of support varieties is in some sense, some limiting construction uh, that falls back on Frobenius kernels. So it's not really intrinsic to the algebraic group. So this problem is, what are these mock injectors? How do you classify them? So, so it sits as a polynomial in T to the Q minus T? No. Um, the induced module from the trivial group is this. No, but how the, what subspace is this inside K of T? Is it K of T to the Q minus T? Um, it's, I don't think we can explain it quite that way. It's, um, it's these guys, the things that are invariant under the action of FQ. So it's all F of T such that uh, F of T plus A equals F of T for A in FQ. So, so these are polynomials of T to the Q minus T, right? Um, let's see, you can generate it by things of the form t to the p to the d minus t. Yes, where p to the g is q. Uh, no, for you have to go all the q times p. It, you take all these infinitely uh, many uh, generators. Uh, I mean, it's not nice, but okay, so. That's the whole story, but I haven't told you uh, any details, but that's what I wanted to say in the talk. That they're, they're, um, I'll give you a sketch of a little bit of how we, th I think about support varieties for um, linear algebraic groups, how I think about um, stable module categories. But the more interesting thing are these two questions. The, Inside this, whatever this um, support variety is, how do you, what's the analog of Carlson's theorem? 
how do you know what support you get for uh, G modules? And the only real results I know are for um, Nakano, I think this is Bendel, uh, Bendel, uh, Pillen. They have good results about realizing uh, uh, subsets of the, uh, the first Frobenius kernel. Which subsets in here are the form restriction of a G module? But in, but if you want to, you need to know much much more if you're going to look at all G R modules. Okay, so there's both this concrete question of realizing modules, and there's this fairly concrete question. I can, I'm going to describe to you some combinatorial way I can look at some of these mock check injectors. It's certainly not adequate, and I have no idea how to handle them. But they're so direct and simple that I'm sure some of you can. Is connected? Yes, it was uh, integral domain. And the funny thing is, it, one of the ways I'm trying to detect it is some sort of count that reminds me of what I heard on the first day of this lecture, the conference. Okay, so um, that was the introduction and what I really wanted to say. Now, um, we could finish completely or I could tell you what some of these words mean. Let me, let me tell you, instead of saying what the words mean. I'd rather, rather speak to some one or more um, people who might think about this. Let's think of GA modules. In some sense, that's the absolute easiest linear algebraic group. So I'll tell you exactly what these GA modules are, and it might be familiar to you. So it, the GA module M is a k-vector space. With a sequence. U0, U1, U1. Se infinite sequence of P nilpotent op, P nilpotent pairwise commuting operators. So if that were the end of it, that would be a fairly easy description of what GA modules. But you, such that for all uh, elements in M, u sub i of M equals zero for i large. So that's just in the very simplest example. This is a um, amusing situation. So maybe, maybe um, I'd like to sort of introduce the flavor, anyway, of support varieties and stable module categories. So the idea of at least this geometric idea of support varieties goes back to, again, John Carlson. Um, who tried, who conjectured, and then Rune and Scott answered only for elementary abelian p groups, conjectured a description of um, 
the support variety of, let's say, an elementary Boolean group in terms of algebra maps not co not hop maps or anything just algebra maps to ke he looked at it um, he chose a basis when joy and i there was no such description before petsova but when we have this for a finite group scheme, we think of something very similar. So there's a flat map? Yeah, flat map. We are going to just, we think of something similar. Well, we, if we don't assume, maybe we'd like, I'd like to look at an algebraic extension. So into, um, L, the group algebra of G. So these are flat maps which factor through some abelian subgroup. G after we base change. So, and then uh, we looked at equivalence classes, which makes a considerable difference. John looked at, he chose a basis instead of equivalence classes, which is one reason why I think there was some. So, so, so are you defining pi e this way, or are you? This is the definition of uh, pi g. Okay. And I'm going to motivate uh, how I'm going to define uh, support varieties for um, linear algebraic groups. And so support varieties, the motivation was to um, detect following uh, equivalent stratification, at least detect projectivity by uh, maps from this very small algebra. And that's been the philosophy, finding nice little algebras that would tell us much more, even with our work, Chris. Um, so I had the idea following an approach due to um, Andre Sluzlin, um, Chris Bendel, and myself to um, we're now in we want to replace this finite group scheme, and a finite group scheme means that its coordinate algebra is finite dimensional. It's like finite group or infinitesimal, a Frobenius kernel, infinitesimal group scheme. And then, now, my idea was to look at um, one parameter sub subgroups. These are maps. Sign, and then to associate, to, if you have a module M and a psi, you associate what I call a Jordan type on, I don't know what the notation was. And in particular, the support variety was the collection of psi such that the short type was not all blocks of size p. That's exactly the generalization of an alternate, a third version of, one version of defining support varieties for finite group schemes uses cohomology, another, the one, the default one uses pi points, and a third one uses um, this sort of idea but for infant in the infinitesimal group case. So, so what is the condition that the Jordan type is non-generic? If you will, 
pi, I, here, I'll write it down. Pi of g m is the space. We could actually put some in, I'll tell you, but the size such that the Jordan type of g m has a block of size less than p. Block, but when you talk about blocks, you need one operator. And here I, haven't, I haven't told you what the operator is here. I want to associate to psi some sort of operator, not surprising, and I want a p-nilpotent operator, not just any old operator, a p-nilpotent operator, in a natural way, associate a Jordan type and say those are the, and it's going to, so there's, it took me a couple of years to You've got to flip around and do funny things to do this. But it works, and you can do some computations, and you, there's a reasonable um, support theory here. But then uh, Julia suggested that what I'm really doing, and I've resisted this, but it's true, that this only works, I'll say this works when I have a good hold on what the uh, one parameter subgroups are for um, algebraic groups, which Paul Sabaji has studied, um, of exponential type, what I call exponential type, starting with uh, the general linear group. Then we know exact, we can describe these things concretely, and it's not so much I need the concrete description, but I need an involution in order to Define this um, operator. So, Julia. So, if a group comes from characteristic zero by reduction. That's not. Reduction. That's, that's not enough. No, I can't do it. I can do it for classical groups, but I. It's not enough. I don't. It probably is enough. I can make. I can make this definition, but I don't know how to construct this involution. I need. I guess you mean that you take some psi, you look at all the different b's that are going to act on him, according to restricting along psi, and then I'm asking about the Jordan block for each one of the actions in the bi's. Here you go. Let's ignore Julia. Um, let's suppose our, x, our psi is of the following form. It's some sort of exponential associated to some penal potent matrix. Okay. And I take this um, S greater or equal to zero, so I have a whole string of P nullpotent matrices. That's these pairwise commuting yeah. nullpotent elements in the Lie algebra. And I compose these with um, powers of Frobenius. This is what a typical psi looks like in a good situation. Okay? And then it's easy to write down without this involution. What I want to look at is the sum. This will always be a finite sum. E, B, lower... S, the push forward. This is a this is a map from G to G, the push forward of a particular operator U S. So into here. So I look at that finite sum. Uh, so what does this mean? Product over E B S. This is exponential. If you want, if we're in the general linear group, I should just write exp. Ah. And these are p nilpotent. So we don't worry what exponential, you know, you just take the ex exponential, the truncated exponential of the penal potent matrix. So what, what is BS? B, um, B underline consisting of um, B0 um, up to, it's a finite sequence. Is a sequence of pairwise commuting p nilpotent elements in the Lie algebra of G. Which are images of this U? No, no. Uh, pairwise, each BS uh, is in the Lie algebra. Ah, in the Lie algebra, okay. You opened a can of worms, Chris. Okay, Julia's suggestion was, Eric, what you're really doing 
is it some sort of, uh, is it related to arts in Hasse exponential? Ah, uh, if I didn't take penopotent, or so, it is, yes. But I'm taking a very naive exponential here. Yeah, it's also related to things that Sarah played with. Yeah, exactly. So Julia said, and this is my definition, and that's the end of our support variety, pi g should be just the co-limit taken appropriately of pi for various kernels, and uh, pi g m should just be the co-limit of pi g r m restricted to g r. Now, this is not, it's still not satisfactory to me because um, this gave me a lot, this was explicit and um, gave detail, whereas these pi points are equivalence classes, so they're more difficult to work with, but if you're in a categorical frame of mind, this is fine. So here we are. But is it true that this is the same? It's the same, this is not everywhere defined, that's every, yes, where, the, where this is defined, it's this specialized system, yes. I, need, I needed, in order to define this heuristic formulation, I needed these to be groups of exponential type. In the special case, these are groups of exponential type. This turns out to be the same as this. But, but what, uh, this BS, uh, the, you have to choose them? No. The, the variety of one parameter subgroups is the in variety of all um, ah. strings of ah, 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 BS is come from psi, from the method. Uh, psi is, one psi corresponds to a string of BSs. Ah. So in this case, it's very concrete actually. Let, it, let's say we're in GLN, then um, the, um, this pi is um, some sort of inf co limit of um, the space, this is what I call it, the commuting variety of p nilpotent elements of the Lie algebra of G. This, these are um, R tuples of pairwise commuting. Involves p it, it's a it's a commuting variety. It's, it's hard enough to look at pairs of commuting elements, much less R tuples of commuting elements. Ah. So, so is it just the same thing as saying the following, that you have distribution algebra of GA, which is generated by things like uh, x to the n over n factorial. Mm -hmm. And this ui is x to the p to the i over p to the i factorial. And, and then you just take the sum of these, which is... Uh, uh, no, uh, but you're describing what's going on here. I want to describe for a particular psi, and I want to vary psi. That's where the... the yeah, yeah so you take some particular element in the completion of distribution algebra, here. which is just the series for the exponential, and you apply this psi to that. Is this what, what you do? Yes, basically, yes. Yes, you push forward. I mean, it... Well, but you need, this in, you, need this, you need this involution, but you want to push forward something here gotten by summing all these use of S's. That's the, that's the intuition. And you get an operator, if you have a p potent operator here, you push it forward to here, and then you, you know. Uh, what is the, I mean, what is involution? Ah, uh, it's this, this doesn't stabilize with R, so you've got to, you've got to take a, a string like this, and you've got to flip it in indexing, and then it, it, there's a technicality. So we stick with this. So now we have a support, we have a support space, and, a, and we can talk about certain subsets in this support space. So since I don't know when I'm supposed to stop, but l let me just, I really wanted to get to um, stable module category. But just to tell you one link, 
Um, maybe I don't want to look at my paper. There, we have this support space, and we have the stable module category. I want to get to these mock injectors. So maybe we don't have time to talk about it. And just for example, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, what I call R complete, that means some decent behavior with restriction to um, G sub R, R complete. Uh, maybe we can just take uh, realizable subsets. And over here, we'll take uh, R complete uh, localizing um, tensor subcategories, or tri triangulate, let's just say triangulated, triangulated subcategories. There's also something for the finite dimension where you have compact objects or, you know, for, but in any event, there is this correspondence of this support variety has something to do with the stable module category. And it's exactly, this theorem is really just a ripoff of um, a theorem, I can't pronounce their name, but it's BIKP, the famous Benson, E. Angar, Krause, Petsova work but it extends in this infinite dimension. So let's go to this. That's a motivation that we have this connection between some heuristic about what support variety should mean and some stable module category. This is a triangulated category. It has tensor triangulated category. It has lots of interesting properties. But the support varieties don't see the mock injectors. So I, I wanted to get to the concrete thing about how you might study mock injectives. So, so support of a mock injective is empty. Empty. It's empty. Which is quite distressing at first. But then you might say, how do you classify mock injectives? I don't have a clue, but that's what we're going to talk about. So study mock injectives. What we're interested in is the derived category. You divide out, you take the mock injectives and you divide out by the, this is a triangulated category, you divide out by the complexes of injectives. So I'm interested in the proper mock injectives. So my idea, which I've been trying to push through, is I take the coordinate algebra G, and I take um, some subspace. Well, I take a family of subspaces with the property that the union of the xi is O of G. Okay, and I define this subcategory, billion subcategory of my G. Um, this is the category of M such that the co action, the co, you know, co action delta M goes from M to M tensor Xi inside OG. And it's convenient to assume these are finite dimensional, but you can do it for anything. And now, it's very easy to see there's a, um, a right adjoint, which is left exact. And, uh, sorry, I'm getting carried away. Um, I want to go from mod G 
to mod gx. Just sending m to m sub x. Okay, so if I have a family of these finite dimensional subspaces, union that I can look at, I can associate m to this family, m sub x i. Each of these is a g module. And it's easy to see that um, m is injective if and only if each of these is injective in these little categories. So that's the start of what I'm trying to do. How many minutes do I have, Julia? Three. Three? Great. So in three minutes, you just need to tell Pasha what you're talking about. He can ask me what I'm talking about. Okay, so I prefer to um, look at co-algebras co than subspaces, but that's, that's pretty easy. We can, um, it turns out much of this doesn't depend on what increasing sequence of, let's say, finite dimensional subspaces, but to, we can choose each xi to be a finite dimensional subcode algebra. Which is not really um, necessary, but it's reassuring because then mod, uh, let's call it ci, mod x mod g ci is just the co-modules. It's something familiar. Okay. So we've got a test for injectivity. Just restrict it to any one of these things and see if it's injective. So I propose doing the following. And this is at the very beginning. Many of you could work on this without understanding a word I've set up to now. You can define a G module to be cofine if each um, m restricted xi is finite dimensional. So in particular, that, that means that m is countable. But all the things I've been looking at are actually cofinite. And then when you have that, you can start talking about dimensions. So like you can, you can apply this to all the mock injectives I've encountered so far in examples. Now we want an invariant. And that's what I'm going to end with is my first proposal for invariant. So if I take a uh, cofinite G module, Suppose there exists um, a C and an E such that the limit of the dimension of M restricted to a specific CI, or well, maybe we'll make it CD, just limit over D, CD over D to the E is C. So that says, suppose this dimension grows um, polyn as the polynomial uh, eth power and with leading coefficient c. So th th that's my invariant. This pair. Okay, question. Okay, question, Sasha. Uh, uh, yeah. I've got 30 seconds. Yeah. What does c? CD, so you have the sequence oh, CI? Maybe I, should, maybe I should have used a different letter. I'll use X here. I'll use X sub I. C is a number, and E is a number. C, C, C XD, yes? Yeah, or XD now, yes. Okay. Yeah, let's XD. Yes, XD. Thanks. 
but but this sequence was of X's was somewhat arbitrary, right? Ah, okay. So you either fix, and there's several canonical ways to choose, or not, almost canonical ways to choose these increasing family of finite dimensional co-algebras, and you fix that, or you don't fix it, and then only the E is well defined. The E is independent of any collection of XIs. The growth, the power of the growth, not the coefficient. Okay, the punchline, there is no punchline, but I can do a few computations, and all the, this is certainly not a very good invariant, but they distinguish all the examples I know. This invariant. But this, if I are uh, related to Fabianus <laughs> what, what, what? What's no, no, there, these are, what Frobenius kernels, are the quotient, if you think of coordinate algebras, the, the finite dimensional quotients of the coordinate algebra. Ah, okay. I'm now looking at sub-finite sub dimensional sub co algebras. Ah, ah, ah. So I'm, I'm trying to, this is the whole problem with detecting injectivity. So I'm trying to think of things inside the coordinate algebra rather than quotients of the coordinate algebra. And that's fine, this works, but now I'm looking for invariants, and these are counting invariants. And the point is, Associated, if I have any family, maybe it's sub co algebra, it's easier, then I have this adjoint functor so I can take a given G module, and this is actually the biggest <coughs> sub G module, which has this property that it's co action um, in both of Xi. Or do you need the property that delta of Ci is contained in the sum of Cj tensor Ci minus J, like a filtration preserving? The co-product preserved filtration by It's C. true, but I don't need that. Because otherwise they are completely arbitrary, so I don't see how this definition can... Oh, I'm, but I'm, I'm assuming that the X... I call it an ascending converging sequence. Yeah, yeah but I could relabel them, like I could take... Wait, right, exactly. So I... It, you take a specific... Um, if you relabel them, you're not going to change the exponent, you're going to change the coefficient. Well, I could relabel them in a very serious way. I could omit, for example, most of them and take only x's with subscript right, right. You know, and factorial. Okay, so, okay, I, I can make this more specific, but there is some arbitrariness of the C, but if we fix this ascending sequence of co-algebras, and there's some natural ones to fix, then you get reasonable numbers and I can, what I'm trying to do is detect, um, tell the difference between different mock injectors. Ah, so you have a specific definition for this sequence. Well, for example, I'll choose a selection, a, um, a collection of increasing sub -co finite dimensional sub co algebras. Yeah. Well, it needs to be some condition in order to uh, uh, You want me to tell you the one I use? <laughs> I <laughs>